Pink Panther flakes are pink, and so you as you Pink Panther, they are a pink. Tickles me pink. Pink Panther flakes are pink, and so you as you Pink Panther, the color of pink. Tickles me pink. Hey, Pink Panther, we love Pink Panther flakes of pink and sweet and brand new. We love them one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different vitamins just as much as we love you. From Post. Why don't I show you a step-by-step -step way to draw the Pink Panther, okay? The first panel is an oval, another oval, but an angle. A triangle to shape his nose, draw up to his forehead, another triangle. Next step is making the eyes, then the eyebrows. You put the muzzle on and you put a smile line, maybe a cheek line. Then we add the ears, a form of triangle with another little triangle softer though then we put a dot two and one is my signature then we put the whiskers on i like three and you have the pink panther's face now if you do a three quarter it's a matter of taking the oval putting it on an angle and making the other oval to one angle putting the triangle on a three quarter shot putting the eyes pupils the eyebrows i can make him a little angry and then the muzzle which comes out past the oval line the smile line, and now I can open his mouth, bring the lower part down, show the tongue, bring down the forehead line to the ear, make the soft triangles, foreshorten the other side a little bit, and you have the Pink Panther. Again, oops, I forgot the dot and two dots, and the three whiskers, which makes now a three-quarter shot on the Pink Panther. I'm going to just draw a quick sketch of the Pink Panther on this paper, okay? Just to show you how quick you can draw the Pink Panther. If I can start sometime. Starting with the mouth, like that, little smile. Put the ears on, chin like this. One dot, two dots, that's my signature on the Panther. I'm under a lot of pressure here. Put his, his other hand down here. This is called quick sketch and I make his tail go like so. Leg coming up across, thick and thin lines. And his feet are like an almond. And put the whiskers on him. And then have him look at us. Put a little like that. Put a little bit of red on this. And we have the panther in action. Oop, I forgot his eyebrows. Do this. And now I think I'll put a little quick pink on him. Look what's happening. My pen is drying up.
Think of all the animals you've ever heard about, like rhinoceroses and tigers, cats and mink. There are lots of funny animals in all this world, but have you ever seen a panther that is pink? Think! A panther that is positively pink! Well, here he is, the pink panther. The pink panther. Everybody loves a panther that's pink. He really is a groovy cat, and he's a gentleman, a scholar, he's a acrobat. He's in the pink, the pink panther, the rinky dink panther. And it's as plain as your nose that he's the one and only truly original panther pink from head to toe. Yeah, he's the one and only truly original panther pink panther from head to toe. Ah, public cleanup week. The boys are doing a little painting. Even the panther is lending a hand. But what do you do when you run out of paint? You use the old noodle, plus a brace and bit. <laughs> the only trouble is that the idea might be catching. It looks like the Pink Panther is taking a little time out to relax at the beach. Ah, this is the life. Of warm sand. But as they say, time is running out, and all good things must come to an end. Look at this reckless fellow. Folks, you are looking at a picture of raw courage. Did you ever see such deeds of daring do? Getting a little bored with it, huh? That's good, because it's time to let somebody else use the bathtub for a while. <laughs> Boys and girls, if you ever need a balloon blown up, just run to the Pink Panther. Of course, you may not get your balloon back. But how many kids have a Pink Panther balloon? The Pink Panther is going to do a little home wrecking, folks. Keep your eye on the ball. Oops. Must have been made out of inferior stuff. Well, kiddies, the moral is, don't go to pieces on the job. The Pink Panther seems to have an eye for art, especially when it isn't hung right. Hey, now you better get a mop. The Pink Panther is rehearsing a new circus act. Careful there, don't fall off. Uh-oh. Looks like an obstacle blocking the path of his new career. trying to rummage up something to eat. Tough going, pal. <laughs> Things are rough all over. Just tighten your belt another notch. <laughs> What's this? Has hunger driven him out of his head? in his madness. <laughs> That's what I call a real square meal. <laughs> There's nothing like a little Sunday afternoon lawn mowing. Hmm, you never know where these weeds will turn up next. What is this, an eggplant? Maybe you better give up gardening and take up bird watching. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, to entertain you with feats of mystic and magic, the great Pinko. Before your very eyes, he will saw a pink panther in half. Notice that at no time do the fingers leave his hand. There, wasn't that marvelous?
Thank you, Maestro. Take a bow. On second thought, don't take a bow. Ah, having another go at it, huh? If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Oops, don't look now, but there's that bush again. This time, prune it good. Uh-oh. Well, at least you won't have to worry about cutting that lawn now. My father not only was greatly talented and witty and funny, but he was actually the pioneer of animation. And when you think about it, uh, there were 11 people who actually started with Walt Disney and, uh, and Hugh Harmon and my dad, who actually started this very wonderful art form that's so popular today. My dad was a 17-year-old kid who loved to draw. He lived in Kansas City, Missouri, and his parents wanted him to be a violinist. He was a very good musician. He became a violinist, and I think that was one of his secrets of being a great cartoonist is his timing. There was an ad in the newspaper in Kansas City, Missouri, and it said, Delivery Boy Artist. And he got to the door, and he didn't have the nerve to go in. So he went back, and he told his mom that somebody else got the job. Then two weeks later, the ad appeared again, and, the, and his mother said, you go back and you get that job. And he went in, and he got the job. And that was the beginning. It was called Film Ad, and that was the beginning of his career in animation. And Walt Disney was working with him, and he said to my dad, you know, I think I'm going to go out to Hollywood, Walt Disney said that, and try this new form of art called animation. And um, so he came out to Hollywood, and uh, the story goes that he said, you know, that Freeling guy is a pretty good artist. Maybe we could talk him into coming out here and, and working in, in this field. So he called my dad, and my dad said, well, you know, I'll try it. So he, my father was a very poor boy. He didn't have really means to get out here. He didn't have a car. So he took a train, and Walt Disney met him at Union Station here in Los Angeles, picked him up, and took him to an apartment house, and he went to work for Walt for um, about five years. My dad went by Isidore Freeling for many years. The name was Jewish, and then when World War II broke out, and during the McCarthy era, and quite frankly, in Warner Brothers and maybe other studios, they asked him to take the name Isidore off because they couldn't sell it in the South and overseas. So they gave him the name, they gave him the initial I Freeling, they dropped Isidore. So he walked around for years and he says, what kind of name is I, you know? Who? In fact, Walt Disney used to call him I.P. Freeling. But uh, so finally, they all said, you know what? Why don't we try Frisbee? Well, there was already an artist called Frisbee. So they dropped the B and they call him Frizz. And that name just was very typical of him. He also felt that whenever you put two letters together, it always became successful. He had Bugs Bunny. Pink Panther, Daffy Duck, and so he felt the two Fs together was going to really help his career to be to be noticed and Frizz Freeling, he thought was a really good name. My dad um, was always the same. You know, he was always surprised by his, his success. I don't think he really realized until later in his life when he started to be honored and in other countries and the Museum of Modern Art honored him, that he really was as great a talent as um, he was. And I, I just think he loved his work and really didn't think of himself as a famous man. I didn't realize that my father was doing something famous and neither did he. He was such a simple down-to-earth person. We had a duplex in Los Angeles. We lived upstairs and he's Saturdays and Sundays we were fixing things around the house. To me, I said to him, Dad, why aren't you an accountant or a doctor like my other friends? How come you just do drawing of cartoons? That's such a baby job. But he was just the most sincere, down-to-earth person. He loved his wife, Lily, our mother, and he was devoted to his family. The stone, the stepping stone in everybody's life.
I believe he had three families. I think his first family, and the most important, was us. Lily, his wife, Hope, myself, and then his, later on his grandchildren. And the second family was the people he worked at at Warner Brothers, uh, his colleagues. And I think the third was his actually his characters, his cartoon characters. We felt like they were brothers and sisters to us. We really did. We felt like we knew every one of his characters and they were part of the family because they were all him. I used to say Dad, to my dad, how do you direct a cartoon? And he said, well, I just put myself into what they would do. And he did have all those personalities. To me, the Pink Panther was very much uh, somewhat like Bugs Bunny. You know, in a, obviously in a more quiet way, but he was mischievous, you know, so I think there was some of Bugs in the Pink Panther. He was Bugs, Tweety, Pink Panther, was his favorite cartoon character, of course. That was the one that was his baby. They also, um, among many of his colleagues, said that they, he created um, Yosemite Sam after himself. But some people think he was the little white guy in the Pink Panther. The little fellow with the mustache and no hair, and he was short. And I think you kind of draw yourself and you don't realize it. So the little white guy in the Pink Panther was very similar to my father. Because my dad was short, he had red hair when he had hair, and uh, he had a little temper. But he never really admitted to that. I, I don't think, uh, I think he felt like he was more like the Pink Panther, a little more mischievous and sophisticated. My mother had a lot of input in a lot of my father's work. She loved high top hats and tails and canes, that Fred Astaire sophistication and my dad put that into his characters. Uh, we have pictures of Pink Panther with the high top tails and cane and I think that was a lot of my mother in him. If you look at the cartoons, they're people, they're humans. They have the feelings and the senses that we have. They have the sensitivity, they have the, the humor, the cleverness of real human beings and he just exaggerates what they did. And I think that's what made him a genius. He could tell a story in one frame, just by the expressions. And I think he loved the Pink Panther because he was a mime. And a mime, everybody in the world could understand him. He didn't have to speak any language to be loved. So when he went to Europe, the crowds would just scream and yell because they would love the Pink Panther. It was their favorite character. And it was my dad's favorite. And he won his Oscar with the Pink Panther. My father won five Oscars over his lifetime and three Emmys and I'd say that he was as proud as all of them you know and really he was very self-effacing because he never thought he was that good and it always surprised him when he did win an award. It stunned him so he was thrilled when he won the Pink Panther as all of them. He said that the Pink Panther was the one character that didn't have to have a language. Everybody loved him all over the world. His 40 years, I think my dad expected it to go on for at least another 100 years more. So his love of the Pink Panther, I think he very well expected it to continue.
The appeal of the Panther character, I think, is because he's he's uh, so promiscuous and and fun-loving, you know, devilish. He's always he's a prankster. <laughs> Everybody has different ideas on what the Pink Panther is. We all have our individual feelings about it. I think he's adorable. I mean, he's like a house pet. The key to the Pink Panther is simplicity and identification. And there's something else that goes along with it, too, and that's sophistication. It all started when Frizz and I were working for the Warner Brothers Cartoon Division. Well, it was Isidore Freeling, and somewhere in the annals of early Warner Brothers animation, there was an animated character by the name of Senator Frisbee. Because of his involvement with this character, all of his cronies at Warner Brothers started to call him Frizz. Frizz Freeling was literally a genius in his own right. I don't think there's anyone that I've ever seen that understood the timing element of, of, of cartooning. In other words, how to pull off a gag the best way possible. He had a sense of timing that nobody else that I ever worked with could come near. One day I got a call from the New York office saying, get on a plane and get back here. They told me the decision had been made to stop the production of cartoons. Got home, started to think about it, and decided that I wanted to have my own business. I had to have a, an animation director. So I approached Frizz and I said, after all this Warner thing is over with, would you like to go into business? Let's form our own company. Frizz and I did indeed go into business together as DePatty Freeling Enterprises. We got along on a diet of television commercials, mainly for, you know, the first few months of our existence. Then my life changed. One day the telephone rang and it was Blake Edwards. I uh, went over to his office and he handed me this script called The Pink Panther. He said, I want you to design for me a Pink Panther character. Like everything else, you don't know the genesis, really the genesis. One of us suggested that we actually bring the panther to life. It most likely was either me or my uncle, who was uh, an associate producer, an executive producer on that, Owen Crump, uh, who uh, had a career at Warner Brothers and was very close to David DePatty and Frizz Freeling. Once it was mentioned, then I can remember constantly sending telegrams back and forth about how I saw the character, I made up a background for the character. So Frizz and I went back to the shop and got some of our top uh, designers together. And we came up probably a week later with, I'd say a hundred or more, different variations on what a Pink Panther would look like. So we hauled all these over to Blake's house one Sunday afternoon and laid them out on his living room floor and he walked around and looked and Blake is a very decisive guy. And what he did was he went over and he pointed to this one. He says, that's the one I want. The character was born. Probably more than anyone else, including Frizz and myself, Polly Pratt made the major contribution to the Pink Panther because it was Holly's design that Blake picked that day. All he did with the character was he put it on his production letterhead and I think on business cards and that type of thing. And that was it. I'd say three months went by and uh, I got a telephone call again. Blake says, come on over. He says, David, I have the film in the can now, and I know exactly what I want to do with this character. I want you guys to create an opening title sequence, a main title sequence featuring the Panther. And when we heard that 
Pink Panther theme, uh, it complemented so beautifully the action. We take the picture out to preview. After the main title sequence is over with, they had to turn on the lights and shut off the projector. People were jumping up and down in the aisles and applauding and just, it was screaming and yelling. I've never seen such a reaction. To this very day, I, I think the, the, the main title is, is really an extraordinary couple of minutes of film. After that screening, um, I started to think, you know, there may be life after the main title. This character may have a place in animation. Well, I discussed it with my partner, Friz Freeling, and he wasn't too happy about it. He said, you know, this is a one shot. Well, I said, Friz, I, I really don't agree with you, and I'm going to see what I can do. And I went in to see Harold Mirisch. I said, Harold, I think that we've got something pretty special here. Uh, I'd like to be able to make a theatrical cartoon. After the, the release of the picture and its great success, uh, we decided that we should go into the cartoon business. <laughs> and so we, uh, we managed to convince United Artists. Anyway, about a week later, he calls me back and he says, UA wants to give you a contract for 156 cartoon shorts. You think you can handle that kind of assignment? I took a deep breath and I said, well, let me get back to you. So I went back to the studio and I told Fritz <laughs> what had happened. And Fritz said, I don't believe it. I said, believe me, it's there. But I said, Fritz, we have one problem that I want to discuss with you. You and I have always worked for somebody. We've never owned anything in our life. And we didn't go into business to continue that. I said, I'm going to go back to Harold Mirisch and I'm going to tell him that I want our company to own 25% of the copyright. He says, you'll never get it. You'll never get it. So I went back to see Harold and, you know, I'm, I'm just a kid at this point in my career and I'm scared to death of stu studio executives. He goes, and he says, I'll talk to you later, out. A week later or so, the Mirish lawyers call me in. Here's the contract, 156 shorts and 25% of the copyright for De Patty Freeling. We created a group, including ourselves and Blake and De Patty Freeling, that uh, produced the first cartoon, which was entitled The Pink Fink. The Pink Fink was the first in the series of the theatrical cartoons that we made. and. We were very, very fortunate that year in 1964 to win the Academy Award for it. Immediately then uh, began a, a program of producing uh, uh, six minute uh, Pink Panther cartoons at the rate of one a month, which United Artists distributed. As time went on, we, we made more of them. He, he finally appeared on Saturday morning television other uh, shows developed from that. We had a tremendous following immediately in Europe for the character. And I mean, uh, to this day, the Italians love and adore him, very closely followed by the French, and a big, big calling in Germany. I had no idea that uh, that character would take, I thought it was just fine for the film, but I had no idea that it would take off like that, and that it would have that kind of a life of its own, that kind of a merchandising life of its own. Thank God it did.
is Freeling was a master at timing. So in the Pink Panther, one of the things that is unique is that everything is done with timing and action of the Panther subtleties. Other shows, other cartoons, Yogi Bear and all these others had to depend on dialogue. Now the animators had a tough hope. They had to tell a story with no dialogue. Once in a while they'd have voiceover telling a story, but most of the time the visual gag had to go on its own strength. So over the whole world, the Panther with no voice can be understood anywhere in the world, any language. What happened was that Frizz Freeling was at Warner Brothers and then they closed down, but Warner Brothers let them use the facilities with David DePatty and Frizz and they started doing commercials. And then Blake Edwards came to them with a story called The Pink Panther. And he asked them, would they do a title? And they said, oh, fine, it's better than just doing commercials. So Frizz and Holly Pratt sat down and Frizz directed Holly Pratt into making it. Frizz made some roughs and Holly Pratt redefined them, polished them up. And between the two, they came up with many sketches of the Pink Panther. But the thing was that the Pink Panther turned out to be a special thing that clicked with the audience. And on the strength of that, United Artists came and said, will you do a, a theatrical a series of the Pink Panthers? And at that time, I was in New York and I get a call from David and he says, get your blank back here. We've got a terrific deal cooking. So I got out of my lease, drove back to, to California and I was right with him from the beginning. They wanted to create a series because the uh, title went over so tremendously. In fact, the reviews were saying the title was better than the movie. And with the combination of him giving some rough sketches to Holly Pratt and giving them some ideas, then Holly Pratt would polish it up. And Frizz said that himself, that, you know, that uh, Holly Pratt was his anchor that made everything look good. If you knew Holly Pratt, he was a tall, slender man, and he was the essence of the Pink Panther. Now, things could have gone a different way. We could have had a short panther like Frizz. But Frizz luckily said, no, make him tall like Holly Pratt, which is good for everybody. When we did the first cells on him, they used a red grease pencil for the outlines. And it gave the panther a soft look to him, kind of a fuzzy outline. Then. For later on, they said, well, let's try Xeroxing it with a black line. I said, no, you're taking the softness away from the panther. So they tried it and it just didn't go over well. So they went back to, uh, not the grease pencil this time, they went back to professional girls, they call them inkers, with a brush or a pen. They would just trace the animator's drawings. They put the paper down, then they would take a cell, trace every line in red, and then flip it over and put all the colors to it. Like everything else, you trial and error, you try it. During the time we worked together on this, we did come up and try a voice of Rex Harrison one time on a, a theatrical short. <laughs> more like animals. And we got a lot of bad comments back because many said, "Ah, oh, that doesn't sound like what I thought the panther should sound like. So they went back to the pantomime. When we printed up the credits, we would send them out and they would be pressed onto a cell, many letters. Consequently, if there was a mistake in the spelling, we would have to do the whole thing over. So I devised a cut letter system 
just cut it out of vinyl sticking paper. So I cut through the paper and transferred the style letters onto the cell. If there was a mistake, all I had to do is take an X-Acto knife, lift the letter off, and replace it with the correct letter. The theatricals that we did, we had the luxury, Frizz had the luxury of taking his time with these. They've become what they call, quote unquote, the classics. We didn't have scripts. Nowadays they use scripts. There, each storyboard man was a storyboard artist, and they would write the storyboard and draw it. Frizz would get the writers in his room with the storyboard up on the wall, and then he would act it out and go through it, and then everybody would participate. And someone would say, gee, if this gag here was a little different or twist there, the, the writer would take notes on that and maybe add it or not add it. And so we had these, they call them snowball productions sessions where everybody would participate. So it was kind of a knit group. We'd all get together and, and have fun with it. What happens is you take a storyboard and they call it slugging. You take a stopwatch and you kind of act it out so you can tell just about how much footage you need to tell this storyboard. If you turn out and rough timed it and said, wow, this is eight minutes long, it's too long, then the director would say, take out scene one and scene seven, or crop it up to get down to the five or six minutes we need. And then it, then it would go transfer to an exposure sheet. Pratt liked to use a bar sheet so that Henry Mancini could start his music way in advance of the finished animation. He would write out all his actions, expressions, attitudes. Then that bar sheet would be taken to Johnny Burton, who was our top cameraman, and he would transfer it to an exposure sheet, which then would be given to the animator to animate the levels on the exposure sheet. After the exposure sheets, the director gets the animator in the room, he has already planned it, like Holly Pratt and some of the directors. They would put a folder of extreme poses to direct the animator. Each animator had his assistant, and then the scene would then go to an in-between room where they would put every other drawing in that was needed. Then the cameraman and actually put the pencil test on 35 millimeter film. Then we'd all go into the projection room, and we'd run it. As Frizz would sit in there, and he'd say, back it up, move it forward. All right, now, change the panther, don't have them do this, have them do that. And then when the lights went up, they would take their scenes back, fix them, and uh, proceed to go into production, ink and paint, and follow through. The layout people would draw the layout. The ink lines would be transferred to a cell, clear cell. We would take those lines on the cells and then turn it over and put loose colors around a window on a cell and then we'd put some sponge technique on the wall and a little pattern for the floor, just a little bit with a few lines, and then a flat color on a piece of paper and then drop the cell over it. And that's the style of the technique they used. Holly Pratt, I consider him my mentor. So one time he gave me a scene to animate and it was the Pink Panther shadow boxing. So he said to me, here's the sheets, just take 30, 40 feet and just ad lib it. So I did it and I worked on it. And it came out good and he liked it. So he made me feel good. He rushed in the frizz and he says, come here, take a look at what Art did. So I was writing, designing, wearing many hats. So we had the Pink Panther going, and then when we did series, I had to be there to do, prepare the presentations, make them unique enough that the networks would pay attention to them. So I got into doing three-dimensional pop-ups. So instead of just handing them a script, we'd hand them this folder and they open it up and something would pop up. And they'd say, wow, this is unique. This is something different. So uh, I was fortunate to have that situation for me 
because I work on specials, I do titles, wash his car, and I never got paid. <laughs> no, but I would do all that kind of stuff. I had a great opportunity because they would depend on me to prepare the next presentation to the network. So I would be, as I'm finishing up my work, titles, doing all that other work, I would start doing the presentation. So I was never let off. I would be on constantly. My vacations were like one day at a time because they say, we need to get this to the network. And then I was rushed to get that approved so I can get all the people back to work. <laughs> the Pink Plasma was a fun one. It was all about a um, vampire, a little short vampire, and it was the character, again, the little white guy dressed as vampire. And to this day, I don't know of anyone coming up with a name for him. He was just a little white guy, which, which happens to be for us. <laughs> you know, all the little characters that he created, Yosemite Sam and the little white guy, uh, that, that was Frizz. I had a hate-love relationship with Frizz, and everyone else did too, you know. He could be real gruff, and then, then when he, somebody said, oh, you're too mean on that guy, and then he'd come over and say, oh, I'm sorry, I was so mean. But at the moment, he'd be rah, 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 you know, like that. <laughs> and toward the end of the movie, when Pink Panther's looking out the castle window, and all of a sudden the shoes come up behind him and kick him in the butt. Will you play with me? <laughs> that's my voice on there. And I also did a laughing skull in the show at the beginning. So it was fun. You get to wear different hats. Holly Pratt gave him that loose, tall, wonky look and personality. Frizz added all the timing and subtleties to it. Jerry Shinicky was Fritz Freeling's favorite for any walk cycles that are unique. So he's the one who came up with the Panther's unique little skip and shuffle that he has in his walk. Then John Dunn made the character really come alive with all his funny gags that he came up with. That session went pretty good. Now to hit the road. Whew. I've drawn the Panther so many years, I feel like he's a part of me. <laughs>